Let me call on Mr. Jeff Plattenberg to introduce the visitors from the county first. Thank you very much, Mr. Moon. We appreciate the opportunity. We've got some uh, really important people, some heavy hitters really for the Fairfax County government that we appreciate uh, them coming in and volunteering to present annually the update as to things that are happening across the county. Uh, with us today, we have Ms. Tracy Strunk, the Director of Zoning Evaluation Division for Fairfax County Department of Planning and Zoning, and Marianne Gardner, the Director of the Planning Division. So we're very fortunate to have both Marianne and Tracy here with us uh, to talk about what's been going on with the county. With that, Mr. Moon, uh, if you wish, we can just go Okay, right we have about 45 minutes for this portion of CIP work session. And, and my understanding is that presentation by the visitors from the county will take about 10 to 15 minutes. So uh, we're not going to interrupt your presentation. We'll hold off all my all our questions and comments until you are first done with. And then we'll have some discussion or conversation. Please. Uh, a point of clarity, did you say 45 minutes? Or 45 half? minutes. 45 so we minutes cut this for, in half? 45 minutes for this part and then another 45 minutes for the second part. Okay. Get my <laughs> mic turned on again. I'm Tracy Strunk. I'm with the um, Zoning Evaluation Division of the Department of Planning and Zoning, and we're the folks that do the current development, so actual development proposals that come in, we evaluate those and take them forward through the Board of Supervisors. Let's see if we can get that. Um, and, and maybe before I jump in, I'm going to do a little bit of sort of the big trends that are showing showing up and what we're seeing, um, talk about some of our areas of highest um, development activity. And then I'm going to briefly go through some of the comprehensive plan, which is Mary Ann's group, but um, which is sort of the step before it gets to our development. Thing. And then at the very end, I have a little slide. Um, I know our office and the Planning Commission has been doing work with the school board and some other people about just how we all work together and, and different different ways we fit in. So we've got a little bit to sort of talk about um, the different places that we plug in with each other. Um, so this, this is just a, a slide of, a bit about the forces that are kind of um, showing up in development review in the, the county. This is similar to what you probably saw last year. Um, most of our development is occurring in our activity centers, our metro corridors, our commercial revitalization districts, um, and there's other areas that are that are labeled as activity centers. But the, the comprehensive plan does direct most of our growth to occur in those areas because that's where we have infrastructure, and, um, and that is actually what we're seeing. The... Part of the goal for that is really centered in the transit areas and the metro corridors, for example, and the, the new Silver Line corridor. Um, the idea being that, that people are moving to Northern Virginia, they're moving to Fairfax County, we have to put them somewhere they need to live somewhere, and putting them someplace that they can utilize transit is going to make the most sense in terms of um, leveraging that, in, that investment that we've made in the community. So that's sort of the, the two-second background to why we suggest that those are areas that we want to focus development. Um, and increasing transit trips, increasing mixed use, increasing walkability um, are all those things that we look at for development. Those are also things, obviously, that are going to have an impact on schools and, and how you all get people to the schools, for example. Um, the other thing that that really ends up having an impact on, um, way back in the day, we did not necessarily think that our corridors, our development corridors, were places we would have residential development. So for um, Tyson's and the Reston corridor right along the metro, for example, are not places that we have a whole lot of public infrastructure in terms of schools and parks and things like that. So a lot of our planning activities um, and then development review activities are focused on how do we fit those infrastructure pieces um, into the new residential character of those areas. Um, I did, I did want to touch briefly, some of you all may know about what we call the new proffer legislation, which was um, some legislation that went into effect in July of 2016, so we've had it for a year now, that limited the types of proffers that could be expected um, or can be accepted by the board. And proffers, of course, are the voluntary commitments that developers make to offset impacts on their development. Um, so in areas 
that are that the what we call non-exempt areas that the proffer legislation applies it severely limits what sorts of proffers we can accept in particular um, cash proffers come under very close scrutiny most of the county most of the areas as i said most of our development is in activity centers so um, from that standpoint it's not actually impacting that much of our our development um, since since it went into effect we've actually had three residential cases in areas that the proffer legislation applies. Those are under review right now. Um, I think they probably have 10 or 20 housing units each. So it's a, it's a relatively small number. And even prior to that, we went back and looked. And a comparable period, we would have seen maybe five to 10 cases in that area. So it's, um, it's a small number. It's going to have some impact. Um, the smaller home builders certainly see the impact, but in terms of kind of the overall impact to the county and the number of students, it, it isn't going to have that much of an impact. Where it does impact um, is our ability to ask for um, contributions towards schools in those areas. But again, it's a pretty small number of units we're talking about. And I did just, I've got it up here, but just wanted to, to say, you know, development is market driven. So we can talk about the forces that are impacting it and where people want to build residential and where they are, but but we can't actually force anyone to build any of the residential anywhere. So, um, so Tyson's, of course, is the big. Yep, we got up there. Tyson's is is sort of one of the biggest things that's happening um, in the area. We do our um, our Office of Community Revitalization puts out this document um, every year, which is a, a kind of a tracking document on implementing the comprehensive plan, um, primarily for transportation but also public facilities that was something that the board thought was very important was we we did a comprehensive plan we planned for all this new development in tyson's so then what happened and keeping an eye on how development is going how are we tracking the public facilities so they put that they put this document out i mean that's where most of the tyson's information comes from we have had about um, 30 plus major rezoning applications in tyson's about 25 of those are since the, the plan change in 2010. So that's um, a lot of activity. We've got another nine, I think, under review right now. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, the major shift with Tyson's was really to create a mixed use center and to add the residential. So the current approvals, um, so those 25 that we've had approved could change our current level of residence. Um, right now we have around 21,000 people living within Tyson's. Um, that could go up to, as you can see, as many as 81,000. It's a big, scary number, um, but it's a long time, too. I mean, what we're seeing is generally on the residential side, between one and three new buildings open a year. Um, those buildings probably have tend to have around 400, maybe 500 dwelling units in them. So that's the number of new units we're seeing come online. And more recently, um, the trend that we're seeing is some of those high-rise, uh, most of those are high-rise, some mid-rise. Um, but we're actually, especially in the high-rise, having the developers come to us and say, you know what, we think that it's going to take us longer than normal to lease this building up. Um, the Kingston, which is the first building at the Commons over near the McLean Metro, is opening soon. And they figure it's going to take them at least two years to lease up and have actually come and are going through the process right now to get approval to um, lease out. It, it ends up being technically a hotel, but basically lease out on a short-term basis um, any number of those units. So that's, I think, maybe 3,500, not 3,350 um, dwelling units there that they don't actually even expect all of those to be occupied with real people living here for for two years so that's that's the trend that we're seeing in those those buildings um, and in, in Tyson's the plan does call there is obviously Westgate Elementary School within the boundaries of Tyson's and the plan calls for two additional elementary schools um, one of which we have already secured the land for um, with one of our early cases the second the th second new one third elementary school we're still looking for a site the plan actually um, and this was all developed with your all staff, assumes that the middle school, the growth in middle school and high school students will be accommodated with the existing schools serving Tyson's that are outside the area. So there's no call in Tyson's for a new middle or elementary, middle or high school. Um, 
we have actually just this for just this year in this Tyson's annual report started putting some schools numbers in. Um, we amended the plan last year and a big point of conversation with a lot of the surrounding communities was how many students are coming out of Tyson's? Is it tracking with what we thought it was going to be? So according to what you all told us and what we put in the report, in September 2016, there were around 1,800 students residing within Tyson's and about 1,660 of those were attending public, Tyson's public schools. So that's about 92% of the kids living in Tyson's are attending public schools. Obviously, we have the new basis um, independent school, which is a private school, which is opened within Tyson's. And, and we've had some other people talk to us about some things. So, um, and even some of the um, high rise residential buildings have talked about a lot of these buildings have a lot of amenities in them, including what we would normally look at and think is office space for people who live there to work. And they said what they're actually seeing in some of those sort of small conference rooms and small rooms is um, people who live in the building who are homeschooling their kids using those facilities because um, they have the screens and the wireless and the all that that space, which is, I'm, I'm not sure how much of an effect that is, but it is kind of interesting. Um, the other piece of that, concern that the surrounding communities had um, was not just capacity for students. They're obviously concerned about the capacity of the schools that are serving Tyson's as Tyson's develops. Um, but two things that I thought were, were particularly interesting in those conversations, um, the desire of people to see schools in Tyson's as a community building feature of the school. You know, So there were people who said to us, well, you really, it doesn't matter that you can accommodate the high school students in the existing schools. There should be a school in Tyson's because that's what makes it a place. So that was an interesting um, thought from the surrounding areas. And then the impact on traffic. Um, Vienna in particular was concerned about if the students who live in Tyson's are traveling to schools in Vienna on what's probably one of the most congested internal routes, um, how does that impact residents and the traffic, how does that impact the school students? And so those, you know, it, it, it's interesting, I think, that it's not just capacity that people are interested in when they're talking about the schools in these areas. Um, I would, the chart that you see there, um, this bar chart, if you can see behind my head, uh, is in our annual report, and that is the number of students that are residing in the Tysons area. It looks like it jumps up in those last two bars. That's not because there's really a projection that that number of students will be there, but that's just a reflection of if you looked at the number of um, dwelling units that were approved um, and the number that were proposed, that's how many students you'd end up with. But again, as I said, things aren't everything that has been approved. We've approved 45 million square feet of development. It's going to take um, a number of years before that develops, you know. You know, decades before that all develops out. So the fact that those those bars are higher at the end shouldn't shouldn't be taken to mean that in the next two years that that number of students is going to jump. Um, moving further out, Reston is our is the next piece of our corridor, um, and this is just a map that sort of shows all the development that's that's coming, the proposed developments that are in that area. Again, this area was primarily non-residential before the new plan was, was put into place. Um, and you can see sort of in the center there, that's uh, except for the town center. The town center is included in the rest and transit, transit planning and the transit areas. So, the, so obviously town center has, has, a, has always had a residential component and will. Um, the big white blob at the very top of that um, town center there is actually the, the um, joint pro project between the county and, and INOVA to replan what we what they call the town center north. So where the um, library, homeless shelter, police, um, uh, Supervisor Hedgen's office, all of that area is just entering, beginning the planning process. So um, those numbers are actually show up in the next numbers I'll show you, but that's, that's another sort of long-term project. Um, in the Western area, we've had nine major um, rezoning applications that had with residential that have been approved since the plan was adopted, which was in 2014. Most of those were to add residential in areas that did not have any residential component before then. And that could add um, an additional 2,200 dwelling units. In terms of build out, uh, sort of, I, I probably expect it to be similar to what we're seeing in Tyson's. It's going to be, there's only so much capacity out there. It's going to be over time that, that people build out. We've got another uh, 15 under review. 
and those are just the ones with residential. Uh, those aren't aren't our total numbers. But um, as I said, a lot of it, a lot of what we're seeing does have the is to add the residential component. <laughs> One of the trends that we're seeing in Reston, in particular, is where when we were doing the planning, we really thought it was going to be high rise around the metro. Um, what we're seeing in in the Reston corridor is a desire to build townhouses, um, which obviously are larger and have a different impact on school generation than a small high-rise unit. On the other hand, you can fit a lot fewer of them on the land. So we're not quite sure how that's going to play out over time. Um, you know, it's a unit type that generates more students, but on the other hand, it's a smaller number of units. So. Um, that's what we're seeing in, in Reston. Um, and an area that's sort of coming online is the last metro station, the Innovation Center area. It's an area, I think I charmingly called it, an area of emerging focus there. Um, and we've had four major rezonings since that was, um, I believe, replanned in 2014 as well. That's why we picked that number. Um, and again, that's about 3,000 more units in that area mostly mid-rise and sort of that what we refer to as a multifamily but it's kind of a condo flat type type building um, and we've got another four under review this is another area where we're seeing probably a heavier a much heavier push on the residential percentage and in, in some of these areas i don't know the exact numbers but in some of the areas in this in this part of the county the plan was looking for even as much as a 50-50 split, residential, non-residential, and we're seeing people come in, um, coming in and saying, hey, could we build all residential? And that's a conversation that we're having with these guys and um, your, your planning staff as well about um, how do we evaluate that against the plan language. Um, typically people, typically looking for residential has been you know, we've allowed people to sort of go above that that mix to, to go heavier on the residential thing because obviously for the traffic implications, having more residential rather than, than office in general tends to do things a little better for the traffic. On the other hand, um, that has a bigger impact on the schools. And so one of the things that we, we're doing in some of the cases that are in um, now and in coming in in the future are... Um, really making that an issue and saying no, going, pushing that percentage way out of whack is not in accord with the plan. That's not what we plan for. That's not what we're looking for. So that's something that we're certainly looking at in those areas. Um, and I'm going to breeze a little bit more through this. Um, luckily, Marianne is here to answer the, the questions on the comprehensive plans. Um, because that's that's her office and that's obviously the plan is the guide so this sets up what people then can come to my office and ask me for in terms of a particular development site um, I, the number 28 comprehensive plan amendments i think probably refers is, is a little bit flexible number and perhaps a slight overstatement because if we had several proposals in one larger area that i think that 28 um, number counts all of those although staff might look at that as sort of one area um, some of the major areas, and I'll talk a little bit more about them, the Dulles uh, Suburban Center study, the Richmond Highway Corridor, um, Fairfax Center is, has been recently approved, I believe. We just did that one. Um, Lincolnia is coming. Um, so those are sort of the big areas. The, probably the big thing for you all to be aware of as well is the stuff on the right side of the screen here, which is the site-specific plan amendment process. Um, and this is to amend the comprehensive plan. It's going on now. The northern area... Um, is what they're looking at, the, the part of that map in blue. It's sort of similar to the former area plans review process that we went through. They're taking nominations now, um, and then the process will go over the next several years, and obviously um, they'll be on anything that has residential or a potential impact on schools. There'll be a lot of outreach done with the school staff on that. So that's, in general, just so you're aware that we're going to start seeing um, proposals in the northern part of the county. Um, just to hit some of the high points in the comp plan, um, in the I'm on the right one. Um, Embark, which is the Richmond Highway, is really looking at taking Richmond Highway and creating a much more mixed-use, transit-integrated, walkable, bikeable, um, transit-accessible area. Looking at adding um, residential and a lot of the residential amenities into that area. Um, 
that is anticipated to be done in uh, 2018. I think the plan text just went out on that. Marianne will know more on that. Um, so that's been an ongoing process. Uh, the Dulles Suburban Center um, is also looking to be to be wrapped up. These are a series of plan amendments that were proposed um, out in the Dulles corridor, as you can see on the map there. That should also come to the board by early 2018. So should we we should be seeing those um, um, similar similar issues that we've seen in in the other things I've been talking about. Um, Lincolnia is a new area that that has been under study for a, a while, and this is kind of a two-phase process. First, they're looking at um, designating part of Lincolnia as a community business center, which has some um, implications in the plan and, and some zoning. That should be done in 2018, and then based on that process, um, there might be a further process to look at the land area designations that could um, look at the land use mix and that and some of those things. So that's, that will, that's a slightly longer frame. And then, as I said, in terms of, of interface between the Department of Planning and Zoning and the school um, staff, there's a couple places we touch, obviously. In the comprehensive planning process, which is, which is the development guide, it's sort of broad brush. Um, your staff always provides uh, us information about the schools that serve a particular area where a plan amendment is proposed, what the capacities are, are of those, and if there's planned improvements that will change that capacity. Um, and give us guidance on, OK, if we assume X number of dwelling units coming in, what's that gonna do to the enrollment so we can provide that information in our staff reports. Um, we can, at that in that sort of time frame, provide back to you broad brush, but of course, the, the comprehensive plan, as I said, it goes back to you know, developments actually market driven, so we can change the comprehensive plan to allow residential development, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen um, at any particular point in time. Similarly, during the development review process, which is when there is a particular development on the table, um, we get um, very good guidance from your staff about what schools, again, are served, what the um, capacity is of those schools, and the impacts to the proposed development based on that. And that's, you know, you all update those numbers every year about the cost. And there is, uh, for schools in particular, there is a, a formula that the school board and the board, as you all know, worked out a number of years ago that, that looks at what that proffer contribution should be. And um, except for those areas that are subject to the new proffer law, that's something that we sort of, we see with every application that comes in. Um, and then in terms of what we can provide you all in that sort of same realm is we can you know, provide information like this. How many development cases are we seeing coming in? Um, the question I always, when I was, was actually in OCR and working on that Tyson's report was, okay, well, this has all been approved, but when's it going to happen? Um, and we, we can kind of, uh, again, it's market driven. We can do sort of broad brush if um, a development has just gotten its base approval, you know, that could be, that could be any time frame. If someone's come through and gotten sort of the next stage of approval, which is generally what we call a final development plan amendment, we usually accept, expect to see that on the ground maybe five or six years. And if the development has gone the next step and gotten its site plan approval, um, perhaps three years, depending on how long it takes to build. So we can, based on how far a developer has moved along in the process, we can provide a little bit more guidance as to how many years out you might be seeing those um, might be seeing those units online and people living in them and producing children. Um, although again, you know, anyone could change their change their track in midstream. So, so that was my presentation, um, which hopefully was clear. And then, if you have questions, then we're happy to answer. Okay. Thank you for the presentation, Ms. Strunk. Uh, I think we have about twenty minutes left, and I have Ms. McLaughlin and Mrs. Strauss on my list. Anybody else? Raise your hand right now. Sure. I have uh, Palchik, Corbett Sanders, and Miss Evans. Anybody else? So I have a five board members with a 20 minutes. Ms. McLaughlin. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is a wealth of information, and unfortunately not enough time for us to ask, I think, the questions we'd really like to, to dive into. But at a very macro level, uh, I, I find the information you've provided here about Tyson's to be concerning um, from the school side of things. And so I very much welcome you as the county staff uh, being able to, you know, 
indicate is there's anything that we can do to help with what I'm I'm looking at is um, a perfect storm of problems coming in terms of it, the the residential housing uh, you know uh, projections that more families are moving in than expected and we know then what's that going to do to the spillover effect on our schools I uh, had driven through uh, Tyson's I think it was last Thursday at roughly four o'clock 4 30 it was absolute gridlock so from coming from Tyson's just to FCPS headquarters took me over 50 minutes and I mean, it's basically two exits on the beltway. So I, I shudder to think this is before all this development's really happening. And so while I understand transportation, we know Americans love their cars. And so uh, the more families that move in are more cars on the roadways, whether we have their jobs located there or not. And so I guess I would just say, is there any guidance you can give us that as we interface with the board of supervisors you, know, you work really well with our county with our school side staff but i i know in the end it comes up to the level of what the school board and the board of supervisors have to have a shared understanding and a shared appreciation of what we're about to face so i guess my primary question is is there any advice you can give us and number two but maybe as sort of a preface to it am i chicken littling this thing or is this information you gave us is as concerning as I'm picking up which is we may, may have major school facility challenges let alone the roadway and gridlock based on the numbers of what we're seeing people moving into these dwellings as that we weren't expecting the volume it's hard to say I guess um, I mean, I think in Tyson, the, the in Tyson's, I'm actually not as concerned about it, to be honest. I mean, in Tyson's, we've got, um, we already have the next school site that we need. Um, and I think we're actively looking and have been working on some of the other things. So in Tyson's, I think it's going to be a planning exercise, I think, knowing sort of where the students are going. And I think the impacts on school boundaries are obviously going to be a concern for you guys. Uh, but I think capacity-wise, we probably have the capacity there. I, I, I think, um, you know, the idea is that you can put more people into Fairfax County if we can manage it more effectively and if we can get the amenities in so people don't have to drive as much and we can, um, you know, we have a lot of, even on the roads, we have a lot of capacity on our roads. We don't have a lot of capacity on our roads at rush hour and when things happen. So it's, it's, um, it's not as much that, off peak hours, we don't have the capacity to deal with that. So if, if people are moving in, and yes, they're still going to drive to go to the store at certain times. They're still you're going to you're still going to have to drive. You're still going to have to drive, frankly, probably to your school, um, to the recreational things, to the to play baseball because those types of things. Yes, there might be a baseball field near you, but that's not necessarily where your kids' um, team is going to be playing. So. But if the more of that that can happen off peak, I think we can probably manage that. Um, and I, I would say, um, in terms of advice, just uh, looking out the long term, which I know is what you all try and do, trying to look at solutions beyond, which I understand we're also working on, beyond just building a new school, but using other schools more effectively, doing more. Um, are there ways that we can work with um, to repurpose existing office buildings or to work with a new office building that's coming in and provide facilities in there? Are, where, are, there, are there things that we can move, um, we can more effectively use the space we have? Because we're not just going to be able to build, there's just not, there's just not existing land, whether we could afford it or not, the land just doesn't even exist to just keep building new facilities the way we've used to. So I think it's, it's looking at all of those creative things and keeping an eye. We're, like I said, we're, we're trying to do more of the tracking and to sort of see, okay, this is when we planned it, how many units we thought might be here. This is how many units actually got built. 
this is what we expected the student yield to be out of those places. This is the student yield that we're seeing. So I think just keeping an eye on all of those things is going to be really important. Okay, I, I'll just close by saying as someone who moved here to the area in 1989, I almost don't recognize Fairfax County. And I, I am very worried that um, where some might say we have plenty of development to do, I would strongly disagree. I think this place is becoming almost untenable. We rank in the top five cities in the country for horrible traffic. The commute hours are no longer two hours each way is encroaching on three hours before we know it rush hour will be from the morning all the way until people go home at night for dinner so um i'm i'm i, I will just say to my colleagues here I, I i put my marker down we've got problems in the next decade here and i really hope together as elected officials uh we better start being a little more aware of how bad it is becoming thank you mr short so if, can we go to the what I think is the first page of your, bottom of your first page? So I, I, I'll, I'll, st I'll start my lineup. So the, uh, you know, uh, there's a famous line of, you know, I heard what you said at the beginning, I heard what you said at the end. What was that thing there in the middle? So this thing there in the middle, this new public facilities and infrastructure need in areas previously not planned for residential, um, I, I don't know if anybody's able to discern that, but that's the bombshell here because I don't know what public facilities you're talking about, what that means, but that's the, that, that's the meat in the sandwich there of who's funding it because I don't think we're getting the proffers. I, I mean, it's one thing to say you're planning for it. It's another thing to say you're going to fund it. And since we're reliant on the county for the money, you know, I, I and I agree with everything Ms. McLaughlin said about, I mean, I, I think it's catastrophic to think that you're talking about going from 21,000 to potentially 80 plus thousand, you know, in in a development phase where we, you can't get, I mean, Tyson's as the crow flies is two, what, two miles that way? It, it, we don't talk about miles, we talk about time. I mean, people who move here are stunned that it could take you 45 minutes to go two miles. 45 minutes to go two miles, and we're talking about quadrupling the number, I mean, this is just beyond my, my expectation, but the and I don't even know which one it is where you talk about the dullest end of things because I think I think the Tyson's part is bad enough um, and, and I do want to ask a question about the proffers but I'm looking at that end of Dulles where you know that encroaches all the way down towards Westfield and we can't have a reasonable conversation with our colleagues on the board of supervisors about capital needs and the dis disparate um, distribution of capital dollars. The fact that we have more, and I brought this up at the board, Joint Board of Supervisors meeting, there's not very many of us there, but that we have high intensity use facilities, high intensity needs, we have a dearth of seats, and, and, and trailers galore. And in the corridor just south of that, and you said, well, maybe you could use some, you could use your buildings more efficiently. I, I don't even actually, I, and I, I don't mean to be, but I'm a little bit stunned by that statement because sh between Chantilly High School and Centerville High School, in four years, I'm missing a thousand seats. A thousand. One thousand. That's another, that's half of another high school. I, I don't know how much more efficiently the Board of Supervisors expects us to use the facilities we have. And then you're talking about encroaching further into, because the push from Westfields, it's, it's not any rosier at Oakton or at, at, at Woodson. Um, well, actually it is rosier. It's just not, it, it, it adds to the problem. So the question is, redraw the boundaries to where? Where do, you, where, do you want me, where do you want me to redraw a boundary to to come up with a thousand more seats from, for a high school? There, there's no place to go. So I, I, I'm at a loss when I look at um, how the proffers are coming in, how they're funded, 
whether or not we're getting the funding, the fact that we get half of sort of on the calculation, what is the expectation? What, what are you saying in this meeting that happens over there at the government center to them? Because th this is what you're saying to us. But what happened? Do you go over there and say, you know, new new public facilities? Oh, I, I can't. I, I don't have enough room in the public facilities I already have. I'm not maintaining. We're not maintaining them at the same levels. Are you getting the maintenance dollars that you need for for capital? Yeah. So we're not we're not expanding what we have. I can't put. I mean, if I want to have, let's see, um, at. At Centerville High School, I, I'm missing 555 seats in four years. At Chantilly, I'm missing 431. At Woodson, you're missing 267. And these are with you know, 14, 16, 23 trailers. So I'm educating already in trailers as the, as the default expansion plan. And I see on there new public facilities. I'm like, I, I don't, I don't have a place to put the kids I already have. And that's without the Tyson side. This is the Dulles side that's hitting me. And I said it when we had the one Fairfax presentation that, that I, I think that we're on a, and I, I, it's very rare that I do a full out chicken little. Uh, we are at a looming crisis on facilities. We have aging facilities. We're not getting the money from the Board of Supervisors. We're not increasing the capital dollars. The more students are coming, and we're talking about developing and adding, I don't know, 10, 20, 50, 75, 80,000 more people at a time when infrastructure is already not meeting existing needs, and it's aging rapidly, and we're not planning for any new, and now we're talking about over here, with our other hand, doing um, new public facilities. So I'm just wondering what's happening over there that we're, you know, it's a, there, there is not, a, 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 there's a dissonance in what's happening. Maybe if I can, um, you asked several questions. Um, yes, I'll, <laughs> but maybe I'll, just I'll own to, that. To, uh, he said I could only have one, so I had to fit them all in. <laughs> they were bullet pointed behind the. the I, I understand your your major concern is that of funding, basically, and obviously that's a question that the school board will need to discuss with the board of supervisors. But a, a couple things I, I can mention. One is um, the idea about using space more efficiently. Um, we weren't talking about your schools by any means. We were talking about perhaps using. Um, existing office buildings to um, be able to uh, repurpose those for school uses. There was just an amendment to the comprehensive plan last year that supported this idea of, we call them vertical schools, to maybe look at um, schools through this, this new lens of perhaps there are buildings that exist today that can be used. Um, the idea of the, the traffic getting worse and worse and why are we putting more people in our activity centers is um, right now, before our activity centers were built out, I think the average commute here in the county was something like 40 to 45 minutes, and that's probably on a good day now. The idea, so you can't, we only have so much space to. I don't understand the answer to the question, though, because just saying, well, look at repurposing commercial buildings, you still have to buy them. You still have to repurpose them. You still have to remodel them. And we don't have the seats for what we already have because there's a disparate um, distribution of the capital dollars that we already have. And there really was an intimation to use our space more efficiently. So. Uh, what is the value of the proffer side that the county is getting? Because I already know that there's an inverse relationship. We have more capital infrastructure than do the Board of Supervisors, yet they have more of the capital dollars. Is that the same for what, what's, the, what's the value of the proffer money that they're getting versus what the school board is getting? You mean, does their proffer money um, support 100% the cost? No, of what's the value? What's the value of how much are they getting proffer-wise versus what we're getting? We can go back and, and look. I'm not sure that the contributions that come to the school board, I mean, the contributions that come for the schools, um, 
think go to the school. So I don't want to 100% say that, and then and then not share if the question is: Are the is the uh, board of supervisors getting cash proffers for fire stations and things like that versus not schools? Um, it's a case by case basis. I mean, schools are really the only ones where we have sort of that formula that's out there that you referred to. That's the the half percent, and that's was something that was. Okay, this is what I'd like this to go down for our next step. Look, we we have shared desires, um, and including things like preschool that this board gets beat up on all the time. But if we don't have a better distribution of the capital dollars for more of the infrastructure used by more people, used more intensely, plus uh, um, uh, uh, public use that gets into our facilities and is using it basically seven days a week, almost, you know, I don't know, 18 hours a day. We, we the, the looming crisis with what you presented on top of it, I mean, talk about, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back. I, I, I just don't see the combination of the, the distribution of the proffers, the proffer values, the capital crush on our, on our existing facilities, never mind the plan for apparently new public facilities, which I don't necessarily know what they are, when we haven't taken care of the needs that we do have, and you have an increasing student population. I, I think we have a very, very serious problem that, that has got to be addressed. And, and this, uh, unfortunately, I think pulls back the curtain for, uh, I'm sure the rest of my colleagues will see how, how serious um, it is in not the long-term future, the short, the very near-term future. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. I think that's a conversation we will need to have with uh, our Board of Supervisors. Uh, I have Ms. Pelchik and Ms. Karen Krober Sanders and Ms. Evans. Uh, yeah, I'll be very brief. Uh, thank you. And I think um, Ms. Schultz uh, very well stated some of uh, my concerns. I know Ms. Evans and I are, are having these conversations as we sit with the uh, schools committee. And I guess my question, something that wasn't brought up, is I know we have this formula that we're looking at. but I And I guess I would love to hear from our staff again. Um, especially when we look at the long term, right? The, we, let's all be frank here. The, the proffers don't even come close to covering even our capital, initial capital costs, right? Not to mention the long term. My understanding is, especially for the uh, multi-unit buildings, residences, that formula we are using is way outdated. Um, and as buildings get older, we do see more and more children. So. I know we're starting to have that conversation, um, and I don't know, Mr. Snead or, or, or Jeff, if you'd like to provide more input, but at this point, not to be pointing fingers at each other, I know there's frustration, um, and I know we want to figure out how to help the, the community move forward while also keeping in mind that if we're not funding our schools, our facilities, our infrastructure, it, it's not a long-term comprehensive plan, right? <laughs> it's a short-term short plan toward unsustainability. So as the experts and the facilities experts in the room, perhaps you can you know, just provide us with a little, and maybe when we have more time, a little feedback guidance on, on what do you see as ways for us to better work in conjunction and, and find a, a more feasible plan um, when we have less to work with um, in a county that is growing so quickly. If I can address that, Ms. Pelchek. What I really like is the fact that, um, you know, having these folks come and, and work with us and developing the relationship that we have, um, we have gone heads and tails above where we had been before, not only in the schools committee, but also working staff to staff for an awareness about the impact and the depth of breadth, breadth of the problem that both Ms. Schultz and you, and I'm sure the rest of the members of the board um, are talking about because it is quite clear the proffers the evolution of the proffer and mr moon knows this very well and commented on it before we were grateful at the time of that development to be even getting that 50 percent that was that was a one step well as time evolves we realized that that's a legacy system and the conversation about that is although we're much appreciative as schools to be receiving anything, we've been able to evolve as well to identify with more clarity the true capital impact. 
then the law changes. And it talks to direct impact. And Mr. Sneed did an outstanding job with Ms. Gillis, Jessica, and then Kevin working with the county to identify what that really means. Okay, so here we have the zoning folks, they're communicating, working with us now. They're starting to identify little nuances in the comprehensive master plan as amended that provide us with an opportunity to start getting some of those things as a requirement or as necessary in terms of the applicant's uh, application for the development, that they must address this, this, and this. And we're just now getting to the point where we're saying schools is an impact that must be considered by anybody coming in. If we can get that codified through the comprehensive master plan process, much like the park authority does, then we will be taking care of that much needed concern. And I have to tell you, it's through working with uh, you, Ms. Evans, and Karen Corbett Sanders, and the rest of the board working with your colleagues, um, the Board of Supervisors working with us on development in the, the uh, in <laughs> Ms. Faust district, Mr. Faust district, and, and Janie working with Mr. Faust. So it's been an evolution, but we're having the conversations and we're communicating about what it will take to get it done. Now, the second thing, so that's the first thing. We're having these conversations. Somebody could say critically from an Arden Share quarterback, too late, too little, too late. Well, I say at least we're having them now. Yes, it's late. There is no doubt. But at least we're having them. And then the second thing I'll say, and then I'll shut up, is that not only do we work this initial plan, but we have a perfect opportunity with what is going on in the Tysons region to do a case study to see if the initial planning of the initial two school sites and the yields that we're getting, keep in mind these developments didn't happen overnight. These plans were approved. And then how many of the buildings have been built? Out of how many that were planned? Not many. They're still going up. But guess what? We're not getting the yields from those, from the new ones. Hmm, interesting. Where are we getting yields from? The existing older ones that are in the Tysons area. So we've got a perfect case study to the point that was made by Tracy about monitoring what's going on and seeing exactly what we need to do with that. So if we're monitoring what we approved, right, and we have the legislative piece where Marianne's looking at working with us through this schools committee to find the right mix of language in the comprehensive master plan as amended, <laughs> then we get it codified for any new development that comes down the pike. Well, guess what? You're seeing a whole huge plan that some things are already down the river, right? They're already approved plans, but there are a whole bunch of other ones that are in process. And that's where I think our focus, our opportunity truly will be. But because we're having these communications, because I'm, I'm so appreciative of Marianne Tracy and the work that they're doing and the work that Kevin's been doing with them to try and get, and Jessica, oh my gosh, to get us in that tent and to get those conversations so we can get it codified, that's that's where we start seeing those results. And, and I would just follow up, and I think this is number one um, secondary that it's been on my mind is also the transportation, the transit issue. So, mm. I, you know, from not having enough crossing guards, which I've talked to police officers who think they're covering all of our need in crossing guards. I can tell you my schools and parents will not agree with that. Um, to how do we get kids, you know, out of cars into walking, bicycling, taking the bus. So that's an area where I, I know some of my colleagues may agree rather than being told, oh, well, and then there's finally GPS on the, on the county buses, which I'm very excited about. Let's work on that together because we see an aspect of it that definitely affects what's happening in the county. So I hope on the transportation side, we, it can be more collaborative. Okay, thank, thank you, you Ms. Parachek. Uh, I have uh, Ms. Corbett Sanders to be followed by Ms. Evans and Mrs. Rouse, who have already used up 15 minutes so please consider that, uh, Ms. Corp Sanders. I will try to be quick. Um, thank you very much for this uh, presentation. I think that it's uh, timely. I would urge that I would not stay focused only on Tyson's, just the amount of work that has occurred and uh, ground being broken in the northern part of Richmond Highway um, over the past year. If I add up everything that's been approved and where they're actually starting to demolish buildings, um, I see 2,500 new condos and apartments and close to 500 new um, 
townhouses and uh, um, single family homes on the Richmond Highway Corridor, uh, if I extend down to South County as well. So I, I think that this is something that we need to be aware. Somebody referenced, we have a tsunami coming towards us when we talk about capacity in our schools. And it's not a long-term tsunami, it's actually a medium term. Um, one of the things I would urge is that when we look at our um, yields, that we look at a connection between the affordability of the dwellings being built and the yields. Because it's my understanding in the past, we've looked at kind of a uh, one size fits all, an apartment yields X amount, a townhouse yields Y, and a single family yields Z. But depending on it, and I think if Jessica, if you can kind of talk through a little of what you're seeing, that'd be helpful. Because uh, I know you've been very active in all the Embark Richmond Highway um, discussions. And then the last thing is uh, kind of following up on Ms. Palchik's comment about the aging of some of our uh, buildings and how there's almost a delayed yield based on as the building becomes older, it becomes more affordable, and then we have a higher yield level there. Um, and then just briefly on proffers, I understand that proffers has been our single source for funding for our um, buildings, um, or not our single source, but a primary source. And I would like us to think a little bit out of the outside of the box on this, because as you know, um, we talked about legislative agenda earlier today. We didn't have any language on the um, proffers in our legislative agenda. We kind of got surprised by the proffer bills that were adopted a couple years ago or 18 months ago so we might want to have an assessment from you all on whether we need to do something different with proffers or do we need to look at some other funding formulas such as if people are um, I liked the term that Ms. Derenak Koufax used about um, children's education initiatives uh, maybe we need to look at that in how we fund uh, from other sources All right, who was next on the list? I was next. Miss Evans? Miss Evans. Oh, okay. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Oh, by the way, my colleagues, you know, what's happening outside is something beyond our control. It's a county employees, not school systems. Uh -huh. so. <laughs> Mr. Moon, are you going to have Very good, Mr. Jessica Moon. respond to what I oh. asked? Please. My mistake. I thought that you meant that as a next step. Um, looking at the age of the building and the outputs of students, that's something that we'd like to focus on for short-term and long-term projections. Um, as far as looking at the comprehens comprehensive plan portion, um, where the development's happening versus what we have already, teardowns, rebuilds, and then also we're looking at household sales, like housing sales and the turnover of a neighborhood, not necessarily new dwelling units. That helpful it's helpful in our planning but I think it's also important for my colleagues on the board and people in the audience to understand that those are additional um, pressure points on our schools and I'm particularly concerned when we have redevelopment <laughs> that you, you know, for example, on Fort Belvoir, you had a bunch of uh, townhouses redeveloped on Fort Belvoir. Well, when they redeveloped them, they went from two bedrooms to four bedrooms right, within the, the same footprint. Mm -hmm. The number of bedrooms definitely has an impact. Okay, I have a Ms. Evans to be followed by Mr. Strauss and Mr. Beckerman. Anybody else want to be on the list? Okay, Ms. Evans. All right, thank you. Um, and, and thank you for joining us today. I appreciate uh, getting um, this background. It, as some have said, it is um, sobering, uh, some of this, but it's better, better certainly to be forewarned. Um, I guess this is a, a question maybe for all of you, or perhaps for Mr. Plattenberg, and perhaps I missed it. Um, do we have an estimate on how many more students we will be expecting as a result of the development we're looking at here? 
I'll just say that we, we work real closely together whenever there's a development coming in, they work with our staff to go ahead and do the yield projections. What he, we have found in the past that we've used an agreed upon countywide average, but again, with the talent of the staff, Ms. Gillis, and the, the approach from a, a planning perspective, we're having deeper conversations about how regionally it may be more, and in other areas it may be less. So we're looking at that in a more acute manner so we can better project and predict what's going on. And that, that's what uh, Ms. Gillis was speaking to before when she said that those are areas of impact, the number of bedrooms and so forth. It's so we can have more granular data that we never had previously, so we can more accurately predict and project, and then we can track historically over time and also have um, an accountability measure where we can look back at our projections and modify them if we need to. So you're working on that, but at this point don't have a, an overall total of any? With the overall total, each development is unique and we can go through each one that's identified, the ones we're working with the county where we've identified those yields. So I was just looking back at last year's CIP and looking at the um, our projections for, and I'm now just looking at the elementary schools, and for the most part, it, it, the projections, at least this time last year, were that things were looking pretty good. Um, there were a lot of purple, a lot of green, very little red. So are we going to see that shift significantly this year as a result of that, of well, what we're seeing here? That's a perfect segue in for us to be coming back and discussing with you fully the CIP and showing you some of those uh, heat areas, heat map areas. Right. Um, but yeah, we've got a lot of shifts happening. Do we? So okay. there will be some interesting conversations, and I'm sure many of you will be not surprised in your uh, magisterial districts as to what's going on. Because that, that, that does suggest we're going to see really serious changes here um, if if we're if we're projecting this out and then I guess the um, and, and I'm glad to see that you're looking at specific types of housing because you know those of us who um, live in areas with more you know have more affordable housing that does make a difference and then um, the, I'm not sure who's who to ask this to but when we talk about capital dollars I was looking forward um, to the the bond sales that we are going to approve on November 20th and seeing that an, that a lot of the bonds that have been approved have not been issued back to 2013 and I don't know if this is a question for Mr. Plattenberg or Ms. Michael or Ms. Quinn uh, or for the county but um, I'm, that there were bonds going back to 2013 that haven't been issued by the county. What What is that? Can you explain that to me? You know, the only thing I'd say is, and, and please finance people we interject when you want, the bottom line is the county manages the bond structure and they do an outstanding job with it. So what they'll do in their whole bond portfolio, they'll sell bonds whenever they feel that they actually need them. And uh, I, I know we've briefed on this before because it's a, a pretty frequently asked question about existing or outstanding bonds. Our, our bonds that are school bonds that are voted on by the voters, we use them for our schools. How the county manages the bond fund is solely up to them. It's one of the reasons why we have the AAA rating that we do, and we're very fortunate to have such a sound financial condition. And Kristen, you, I don't know if there's well, anything Well, we, we are, but if they haven't issued any bonds from the 2015 referendum, I'm, I don't understand how, what that, why we wouldn't have any. From. So once they get voter approval via the referendum for the bonds, then they're only going to sell the bonds as they need the cash flow. So it's going to depend in terms of their overall cash flow, their refinancing other bonds whenever they can achieve more favorable rates and adjusting their debt service. So, so it's, it's totally based on cash flow is when they're going to sell them. So I, I, I know people know more about this than I do, but it seems to me we need as much capital dollars as we can get, frankly, uh, for renovations and for additions. I just want to give a heads up to my colleagues that as we discuss the next topic, temporary classroom removal, you will see why, need, why we need more capital funding. So with that, I have two more board members. We have already spent about an hour. So Mr. Strauss to be followed, Mr. Macker. Okay. First of all, thank you all very much for coming. We appreciate our county staff and we very much appreciate the fact that we know staff to staff. You all work very, very closely together, and um, it makes a huge difference, so thank you. And uh, you are not the ones that determine the funding, so <laughs> we, we, uh, we, we can't criticize you for the amount of funding that we get or don't get. But at least the planning, um, 
I think is done um, uh, very well together. And my colleagues who are concerned about Tyson's, I actually now live at Tyson's, and I, I am not as concerned about the development of Tyson's overall because it's not producing the student yields yet. What's going up is very expensive. And, um, but where, where we are seeing an impact is on the existing, existing neighborhoods, townhouses, older apartments, and it's kind of a slow ramp up. But um, I think we have, we have one site that is identified. We need to find another site, and PIMIT will also come online. Um, I think over time, uh, our um, concerns for high school space is going to come. And uh, that will, I will no longer be on the board when some of you have to deal with high school boundaries. Thank you very much. Um, and that will be lots of fun. But um, uh, I do think the Tyson's development has been very well planned. There was a great deal of community input in that over time. And as that is sort of slowly moving out, and I have to um, caution people, there are great ways to be able to get through Tyson's, but you have to know how to do it. <laughs> I drive it every day. Yes, I drive. Any secret tunnel. I will give you the secret way. Strauss secrets. Uh, they also, we need another bridge across the Potomac. That's the other issue. Cascades in Loudoun County need to give up, and we need to be able to have that uh, bridge. Going back to, just as an example of effective negotiations with developers, um, with the help of Mr. Sneed, Mr. Plattenberg, and, and Supervisor John Faust, we've, we just have another school site. Um, off the $28 area, and it comes with a lot of hard nose negotiating with developers and holding our breath until we actually get the resources that are needed before the Board of Supervisors actually approve of a development and what Mr. Faust has done very well, and with Mr. Sneed helping. Um, where there are multiple developments in one area, which is part of what we are seeing, these higher densities, um, rather than negotiating separately with each developer, having, forcing them and us to work together to say because of these two, three, four, five developments that are gonna go in, we're gonna need a school. And you, we're, we're gonna have to force it. And we've done that. So that's kind of the new strategy. And it's at least you know in areas where, where my concerns are, it's, it is paying off. So. Um, uh, I think that is really very good. And bottom line is, yes, we do need more money for a capital program. But anyway, thank you for staff, for you all working as effectively. I'm beginning to really see a payoff. But the bottom line is we've got to work with our Board of Supervisors, and we've got to get more money over time in order to figure this out. Mr. McCartney. Uh Very quickly, I've heard the comments regarding um, including something about proffers in our legislative program, I will work with Michael on getting some sort of amendment on that front. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Anna Koufax, you will be the, really the last one. Um, thank you for being here, and um, I appreciate the comments that, um, that our staffs are working together. I think that's extremely important. I think you, you're experiencing the frustration of uh, the, this uh, we, we don't mean to kill the messenger, and I think that uh, that uh, is um, unfortunately a, a result sometimes of the frustration. Some of these things are some new things we're seeing. I think we were a little shocked at the density um, projections in McLean. Um, some of us who live on the Route 1 corridor understand that pro that that part and those projections, but. It, it, it's still um, when you have it in the middle and you have it coming here and then you're talking about Lincolnia, which was also new. Um, so I really, really do appreciate the fact that we are getting this information now and that you are creating um, this more um, effective and congenial rela relationship with staff. We as a board, um, and Ms. Strauss said it, and you're the chair this year, so uh, uh, you know, this is something when we are developing our agendas, this has to be an agenda and it cannot be dictated by the Board of Supervisors what the agendas are every single time. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but I need to say that again because um, when when the the 
information on what's going to be discussed between the bo two boards is dictated by one board, that's not really a joint meeting because that's not how you all work, work, right? You call each other, you talk to each other, you work together, you decide where we're going to talk and what we're going to do. So we are in a little bit of so you know a, a frustration mode here. So this was not meant to be directed at you, and and you know, but I do think the one thing I would. And I and I realize as a staff member for an elected board where you are, but um, and I'm sure you're doing this. But um, when you th see things, perhaps as, as the planners, right? As this, you know, as the county planners, when you're seeing things, um, please instruct um, that board or our board that this may not be the best direction to take this. I mean, this this board is very seriously concerned about what the this this this. Um, building up is going to do to some of our schools and what we're going to do. So um, I'm, I'm sure you do that and um, I, I just encourage you to keep doing that and Mr. Plattenberg if you can keep reporting back to us for to our board um, what you're hearing um, when when the experts on their board or when the expert staff members are educating their board on what to do and how and how the outcomes are because that's the only way we will know how we can um, make our concerns known. So thank you for being here and thank you for helping to educate us today. Thank you so much. Do we have any next steps? Okay, let's put that up. <coughs> Mr. Schultz, is that your? Does it reflect what you're asking? I, I don't know in the, at the end the future capital needs. I, I, I think I'd like um, in that where it specifically said new public facilities, I, I'd like a little bit more of a list of what that list of public facilities is that's being contemplated. Because it's one thing to have the development, you know, where you talk about residential and you're talking about plans coming in. It's another thing to talk about public facilities like what specifically are you guys talking about in those plans in terms of a list I mean and that was a pretty broad brush thing I think in in the Tyson's plan in particular there's a list of these are the public facilities which is schools um, they actually Tyson's is very broad in its definition of public facilities it talks about fire stations, police stations, it even talks about public art facilities. So it's it's sort of everything. And each different piece of the comprehensive plan probably has a different um, analysis, although in, in general, um, Marianne can maybe jump in and, and what, what types of public facilities do you look at when you're talking about comprehensive plans? Well, in, in Reston, for example, we have a similar list. Um, any of our newer um, activity centers that have been planned, we have uh, a much more precise idea of exactly what's been needed. So we talk to not only schools, but libraries, um, police, and if there's a need for any of those facilities, we'll uh, note that in our plan. Right, but, but, I'm, but when I see that, I, all I see is, again, a broad brush is new public facilities, not a list of potential facilities, the funding source, and the amount that's potentially associated with it, and when. And I'm not just talking Tyson's, because the, the gut punch for me, um, even though it's not, and uh, Mr. Wilson's not here, is it, the, 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 the dullest component to this, the, the dullest horned in component to this, that stretches all the way down, has significant domino effect issues and thanks a lot Ms. Strauss for saying yeah you, you you like Pontius Pilate down there washing your hands of uh, boundary no, no, no. changes. We got it, we okay. got it, but we okay, got a school this, site. Let's do this. We are dealing with the next steps so Mrs. Schurz could you complete your sentence your request whether that new public facilities um, uh, you know uh, is estimated I don't know if the word estimated estimated public facilities funding source and time frames. We'll work collaboratively to give you some kind of language of what's currently put uh, in there. You know what I'm talking about. I do. Okay, so so since that's gonna be that's gonna be shown as the next step to seek a consensus among board members. You know, Mr. Schurz, let me ask you one more time whether that reflects your wording. Yeah, sure. Okay, with that 
Mr. Moon, I don't know whether the board would want to consider a next step, but I've, I've listened to this for oh, the last yeah. hour. I would be glad to meet with the county executive and look about having this as a topic for our future joint school board, board of supervisor meetings. We've tried that a couple uh, of times. Before. I understand you've tried it, and what I think might be powerful is putting that the board would direct me to go to the county executive and say, this is something that we need to do jointly. Yeah. We have staff here, but we're having a one-way conversation that I don't think is solving the problem we need to solve. So I'd be glad to do that if the board so Okay, did I ask the superintendent to address, complete the sentence, that, uh, doc, Dr. Brebrand? To approach county executive about including this topic at future joint school board, board of supervisor meetings. I think this is the exact conversation that needs to happen between these joint boards with the county executive and the superintendent in the room problem solving and getting an action plan as a result of the conversation. Thank you. With that? Hmm? To add to the legislative um, priorities, a discussion of the impact of the proffer policy that was adopted a couple of years ago and whether we need to revisit it. Revisiting the proffer language. Revisiting the proffer language. In our legislative priorities. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because when what happened was 18 months ago, the- I'm trying to see the time frame. When do you think we can have that? We need to add it to the legislative package. We'd like to add it to this legislative package. But he's gonna come, he's gonna, he's gonna do an amendment. Correct, we'll do an amendment to it. But I had raised this earlier and we just wanna make sure it's on our follow-up activities that we all agree with it. And as long as we understand that he's yeah. gonna propose an amendment and we'll be voting on it. Um, uh, someone up there is trying to say he doesn't have responsibility for this, but you need to draft the language for it with Michael. So, okay. Thank you. All right. Okay, with that, let, let me go through uh, top one. Any, any objection to the top one? Second, third one. What about with that, this portion of a CIP discussion is done. I wanna thank Ms. Frank and Ms. Gardner again. Okay, us being about 75 minutes behind our schedule. We're gonna continue with the next, next topic. Thank you very much. Hopefully we'll finish this portion by 4.15. We have 45 minutes for this topic. Thank you very much, Mr. Moon. Um, one of the questions that was asked was really for us to talk about temporary classrooms and temporary classroom renewal. I know, Mr. Moon, this has been uh, a pretty, pretty much a lightning rod issue for you um, and Ms. Schultz regarding uh, the capacity, the seats, and the impact that we have uh, for instruction each and every day of students in our communities throughout Fairfax County Public Schools where their education is in a temporary facility. And we've we put together um, the initial information, Mr. Sneed and his team has put together uh, the information that you have in this packet uh, with Ms. Ms. Gillis and, and they, they can go through uh, very briefly what the information is in here um, and then open certainly for any questions and further discussion. Uh, what we did was you'll see that he's provided it in, in a number of different ways. I won't start to explain that because I'll take away from his presentation, but I think it allows you to look in a more granular sense as to each magisterial district and also broader across the division. So with that, Mr. Sneed. Uh, Mr. Plattenberg, uh, before we go to one, Mr. Sneed, uh, do I understand this correctly that full discussion over this topic will take much more than 45 minutes. So today Absolutely. is just the first step of yes, this sir. longer conversation we'll need to have. Yes, sir, this is a significant uh, issue. It affects everything you spoke about in the last item regarding capital investment, regarding uh, the lack of uh, capital funding, et cetera. It's a longer term conversation, yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so, 
trailers are one of my least favorite subjects. Um, because I, you know, I tell people that I feel like the largest trailer dealer on the East Coast. So besides the trailers that we have at our schools for overcrowding, I have around 330 at construction sites, give or take. So that's quite a few. Um, so uh, over the past two years, we through the both the capital program and the shift of enrollment at. Uh, some schools, we reduced the total quantity of temporary classrooms by uh, 158. Um, so it's 131 of those as a result of the capital uh, projects that have finished between uh, the fall of school year 15, 16, and this fall. Uh, and then in another uh, 10 sites, we uh, removed 27 temporary classroom trailers. At the same period of time that we have added 51 trailers at around 17 schools. Now, so when we look at the projects that are either under construction today or going to bid this school year, we have another 173 temporary classrooms that will uh, be removed. Um, so I would say in about, and that would be over the next uh, three to four years. Um, so uh, I, I, our, I have an approximate guess that we would be sitting at um, around 649 temporary classrooms in 2023 uh, or so. Uh, I do believe the number will be uh, somewhat improved within a year or two of that, uh, just simply because of the, the projects that we're getting ready to start planning. Those would represent uh, an additional 100 temporary classrooms to be removed. So. Uh, not knowing what we're going to add at other sites, I would estimate that we would have between 550 and 600 temporary classrooms. And this is before, before I was a director, so I can't necessarily, uh, I'm not sure how valid they are. I think they are pretty good. Uh, the lowest number that we've had that I can see goes back to 1992. That was 602 temporary classrooms. So, we, we will have, uh, I think we'll be below that number. You know, and it's hard to, you know, remember that just three years ago, we were sitting at 975 and we're down to 822. In addition, uh, you know, so I think the capital program has been very effective. Since 2010, uh, we've increased by 13,567 students. Uh, and uh, if you remember, we added a significant number of temporary classrooms for full day K. Can you, you repeat that just yes. since 2010, what? We've increased by, to this fall, 13,567 students. And, uh, you know, as I said, uh, you know, we've added trailers even, or temporary classrooms, even with an ongoing capital program. It's mostly due to full day K. I think we added about uh, 52 of those. So the question is, and I think that, uh, why do we have so many? There's a couple of reasons why. And we've, we've all talked about the, the reasons. I mean, one, we know that, we, that the capital fund is not sufficient to keep up with our growth and renovate our schools uh, in a timely manner. And we're always having this struggle between do we allow school to become, you know, just almost antiquated before we renovate or do we accommodate capacity? In addition, we know that we have some programmatic reasons that that occurs. It's primarily due to, you know, we, you know, we have some centers that have so many kids in there that uh, it leads to that. And in fact, we're dealing with a case right now where you know, we have an uncapped program and the exact uh, amount of students at the schools over capacity happens to be the kids that are moving in uh, for the program. So. I think you know there are a couple of solutions. Obviously, the number one one would be to increase our capital funding. But secondly, we should certainly look at our program distribution. And uh, I, those are the two most effective means. I, I wouldn't suggest to you all that some minor. I think that some minor boundary changes could alleviate this um, as well. But I don't know that that would be the the optimal or uh, answer when it comes to just removing temporary classrooms. Because you're gonna add on now, right, with yours. Okay, yeah, 
was going to go quick. Okay, anything else to present? We're trying to be expeditious and just answer okay, your question. Okay, thank you. I have, I have a Mr. Shorts to be followed by uh, Ms. Karen Corbin Sanders. You don't happen to have the number of students in each magisterial district. We don't have the exact number okay. um, included in your packet. What we did is we took an average of 25 per classroom. No, I'm, ju I'm just talking the number of students in the magisterial districts. From so you can I, figure a percent or something like that? Because from what I recall, I think the highest number of students, or maybe it's the highest number of high school students, I can't remember, is in Sully. But so what would be interesting, and the reason I'm trying to do this is because there's a little decoding that needs to go on here, because if I had seen, if I would thought about this in advance, I would have, I would have provided um, this, but we sort of did this part just for our colleagues as meeting managers. We did this part a little bit late because this wasn't exactly what we were looking for. So, um, for example, if you see Mason District 2684, I'm not exactly sure what's going on with Drainsville, um, and Providence 2952. So the total number of students, you have to turn your head sideways, total number of students in temporary instructional classrooms. The more students you have in temporary classrooms, and I'm not gonna say it's 100%, but the smaller the classroom sizes are in that district, correct? Yeah, that's okay, you can say yes. This one, on average, you're gonna have more children in, cl in class and trailers when your class sizes are smaller because you're taking, this is my teaspoon of peanut butter across a, 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 a piece of bread. You're spreading out the same number of students in a school and because you've depressed the number of students in the classroom, you wind up needing more trailers, therefore more children are being educated in trailers. Correct. So if you, you know, we published that type of data for a long time in the dashboard. So when you look at our efficiency, the school efficiency or square footage per student, you can see that that, that is correct. So the inverse is true. So the inverse is that in the places where you have fewer number of trailers, the reason you have fewer number of trailers is because you have higher class sizes. So that's part of, you know, this is, this is the conversation. Uh, nope. Uh, uh, I'm, ha I'm happy to take my spreadsheets and the time I've spent on class size up against anyone. So let's, we can have that conversation off away from the table. But um, the, the highest density of students inside buildings is, uh, occurs more in districts where you have fewer um, trailers because we squash the kids into the classroom. So you have a higher, um, and I'm not going to say it's true in every case. I'm saying it's a maximum and it really does play out. So when I have discussions about equity in the fact that there's, you know, 1,800 trailers in the Springfield district um, versus 2,900 in the Providence district or 2,684, there, there's bad sides to both of those. It's bad to have more kids in trailers. It's bad to have high density of trailers in certain magisterial districts because we shouldn't be educating kids in trailers. The inverse is true that if you have extremely high classroom sizes on average across school buildings and uh, the, the teachers in that building all have you know, close to max class sizes, that's, that's a stressor as well. And that also means that we probably have uh, filled those buildings to capacity, but we haven't necessarily we've increased the class size because we don't give them quote unquote needs based staffing to get more teachers. Therefore, if you don't have more teachers, you don't need more classrooms, which means you don't need more trailers. So there are there's an there, these are both sides of an equity coin. It's just a different view of it. Um, and you know these this is the conversation, and I thank Dr. Brabrand for for sort of saying, hey, do you want me to wink, wink, go to the Board of Supervisors and, and County uh, Executive and say this needs to be our next conversation? Because um, you know, we, I, I, we're at a crisis stage. I mean, I, I, I don't say crisis very often. This is a crisis. We are a facilities crisis stage. Um, I think the first time I did the SAC classroom calculation of the number of classrooms that are 
<coughs> in a trailer, in a trailer, um, because a brick and mortar classroom is uh, reserved in an elementary school, um, I still remember the figure, I think it was 6,128 seats. So um, that's educating in a trailer um, in an elementary school instead of in a brick and mortar classroom because of our MOU um, and our MOU forcing our own children out of a brick and mortar classroom in an elementary school and into a trailer to be educated during the day to preserve you know, a brick and mortar classroom. This is a very serious fundamental problem, and it isn't, it's not only not going away, in the time since I first brought this up six years ago, it's gotten worse. We have more trailers, more kids in classrooms, higher student population, um, and a, 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 a problem that doesn't appear to get, um, I, I, I'm not saying that the Board of Supervisors doesn't care about it, but we are not shedding um, or pushing for a shed of light on this issue um, as much as I think we should be. Um, and that goes to the, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, Mr. Plattenberg, I think it's about a 60-40 split in terms of we have 60 plus percent of the, the square feet of infrastructure, we're at 27 a million or maybe we're at 28 million, I don't know. Um, which is about 60 plus percent of the total infrastructure between us and the Board of Supervisors, but we only have about 40 percent of the dollars. Is that about right? Rough. I mean, I'm, I'm not asking. Approximately. It's 75. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, you know, we have, um, and, and that doesn't even account for the the usage, that, that seven days a week community use, high, I mean, uh, um, an office building that's used from uh, nine to five or, um, even a library, the, the um, wear and tear on a library over the course of a week versus the wear and tear on maybe a, you know, a roughly similar square foot of one of our schools just isn't comparable. So um, when I see the kind of presentation that we saw before where they're saying, well, you know, this is the kind of planning that we're planning on planning, um, and we're planning new public facilities, and we haven't addressed a 30-year renovation queue that's almost a billion dollars in the hole, and a, a, a burgeoning, swelling student population, never mind 822 classrooms representing 19,500 of their constituents, just like there are constituents. This is where um, I think there is a pressure point um, that uh, needs to be a part of our conversation. Okay, I have a Karen Corbett Sanders, Ms. Evans, Mrs. Strauss, and Mrs. McLaughlin. But before I go to Ms. Corbett Sanders, could you uh, could you check the uh, amount of capital funding the county is using versus ours? Let's say for the last five, ten year periods. So I want to make sure that we are using the right numbers when we do that. Okay, so Ms. Corbett Sanders. Thank you, um, very helpful. Couple of questions. One, um, I see program, I see the number of instructional classrooms being held in trailers or temporary classrooms. Do you also have the numbers of um, non-instructional classrooms but being used for other types of services such as testing or special education, um, you know, one-off programs versus? Sure. So that column all the way to the right, that's the total number of temporary classrooms. OK. Including that first column that lists the number of temporary instructional classrooms. OK. So you see in certain districts, they're using the um, trailers more heavily for uh, instructional space than others, I see. Um, the second piece of it is, do we have a life cycle of trailers? How long you think is the optimum number of years um, that a trailer, because I know that you have gone in and totally rebuilt them. So I guess I would do a cost benefit analysis of, is it cheaper to go back in and rebuild or just to retire? Well, at some point, uh, right now we're able to get about 20 years life so it's uh depending on the trailer 
at the eight to 10 year mark, we rehab the entire thing. We reskin the outside, the inside, new floor, uh, ceiling, everything to uh, try to achieve 20 years. That's as well as we can do. And so when you look at these numbers, um, how many of these trailers are over 20 years old? And do we have a retire? When we look at retiring trailers, are we retiring the oldest ones first? Or is it primarily we retire them when we do our renovations? Oh, no. I mean, typically, uh, certainly the oldest are going to go first. Um, you know, so for us to rehab, a trailer would cost about 3500 to 5000 depending on the condition. That's for a single classroom. A new would run us twenty two dollars to $24,000. So it makes sense why we would do it. Um, uh, not complaining, I just don't know if you all were aware. You know, at one point, and we have a, an operating account that we use for overcrowding. Um, around 10 years ago, that was at $6 million. Now it's at $2.4 million. So with a growing population, moving programs, I've done the best I can when the thing has been cut by 55%. And so I, I, if I wanted to buy new, we don't have the funding to do it. I have no option but to rehab as many as I can. You talk about programs. What programs are the, um, the, which programs are the ones that drive the, um, the use of trailers? Because there was an assumption made by Ms. Schultz that it was the smaller classrooms that were driving the use of trailers. Are there other programs that actually drive it? Well, it, it's certainly, I mean, obviously the majority not all, but I mean, I have to go back and look. The majority of the AP centers, some of the immersion schools. But the other thing that we've been trying to do is move our special ed kids closer to where they live. A lot of times, the facility is not uh, there, uh, you know, not adequate. So we have to create that at, at those schools. You know, another thing that, and I think that you pointed this out, is you can look at how the spaces are used to have an idea of what drives some of the, the use of a temporary classroom. So, I mean, it's a, you know, a whole myriad of reasons, and it, sometimes it's down just to the individual school level. I mean, we can certainly look at that. I have a Ms. Evans now. Uh, thank you. This is very, very helpful. Um, th these are only trailers, not modulars, correct? Correct. Okay. So um, just looking at, at the schools that I, I know best, um, just to clarify some of these things, Annandale Terrace is saying uh, you've got uh, 13 classrooms. And, uh, and I'm sorry, would you, would you tell me what, what's the difference between temporary instructional classrooms and number of temporary classrooms? Sure, we listed that out um, as a footnote. Oh, okay. The following instruction is included in the temporary instructional classroom counts. Core, self-contained special education, special education pullout, art, band and strings, computer rooms, ESOL, FLESS, health PE, music, world language, multi-purpose resource, work transition program, and high school electives. Okay. Um, so at Annandale Terrace, they're they're going to have a renovation. They're in the process of that. So presumably they'll they'll lose those when um, they won't need those trailers anymore. Correct? Okay. So the other thing I'm I'm trying to understand is at schools that are showing that they have seats. In some cases, hundreds of seats. Um, we're also showing that we have trailers there. For example, Poe is showing uh, considerable seats. Um, Annandale High School has hundreds of seats, but still 27 trailers. Um, why do we have 27 trailers? I mean, we have a modular there as well. We've been working with the, uh, the principal there as part of the transition. He's been working with us to help um, reduce that. Uh, we didn't want to take as an aggressive uh, approach as we initially were starting to due to the transition and the cultural changes and some of the classes they had in there. Um, to maintain the atmosphere for his faculty and his team. From a facility standpoint, 
we absolutely said these trailers got to go. Um, but I mean, we're I working with the principal. Wants, I can yeah. see why we want to keep the modular there. It costs us a considerable amount of money to uh, to put that modular in there. We it may does. need that capacity at a later date. But uh, as far as the trailers are concerned, um, so you you are working on getting some of those. Absolutely, out. and we'll right. take that as a desire for us to continue that work. Well, you know, I, I will will yield to the principal on that as far as what he feels he needs. So um, if if the principal feel he ne he needs that for some reason, I'm not uh, trying to suggest otherwise. No, we've been, I understood clearly. Uh -huh. We've been working real well with. Okay. Uh, with Tim. Um, so, but again, you know, Poe, Park Lawn, um, a number of the Wayne Oak are showing that they they have capacity and yet have have trailers. So I think that's something that we have to be aware of when we're um, talking about this. Um, and so, you know, it's it's not as far as class size. There's a reason we have lower class sizes at our highest needs schools. So, you know, I'm certainly not going to want to go in a direction of, of changing um, our philosophy on that. Um, and lastly, uh, to Mr. Moon's point, um, I believe you said you wanted to get the amount of funding that the county is using versus FCPS. I, I, I don't know if this is in addition to that or if it's similar to but I, you know compared to what we're approving on um, Monday I would certainly be interested in seeing the amount of uh, bonds that were approved in the referendums of 2012 2014 and 16 and how many they issued uh, out of out of the that approved could we get that figure okay thank you Thank you. I have a Mrs. Strauss to be followed by Mrs. McLaughlin. Um, first of all, Ms. Schultz, I'm very pleased that you said, and what's happening in Drainsville? Um, and just to, a lot of the stuff that's going on in the McLean High School Pyramid is the Tyson's um, uh, development, and it's the, it's the communities around Tyson's. These are older neighborhoods, uh, and also just plain high interest in that part of the county for either redevelopment or people just simply moving in. And it's just, it is, it's the Haycock, Kent Gardens, Lemon Road. It is just people buy some of those properties sight unseen from other countries and just move in. So um, uh, the, um, so that's where the resulting, where a lot of those trailers are coming. And it is Tyson's slow growth in. So, you know, it is, it is catching up with our renovations, um, but we do have plans of how to deal with that over time. And obviously the Route 28 corridor and Hutchison, very, very high need school, and they need all the help they can get. And we are very proud that they are fully accredited. We are so proud of that school. They have um, huge, huge challenges and they're meeting them well. So at any rate, that's, uh, Ms. Schultz, you want to know what was going on in Drainsville. That's what's going on in Drainsville. But bottom line is we do need we do need more capital dollars. But again, I have to say, there is some very good planning going on in Drainsville. And I, I have to credit John Faust and you guys. You are doing a very good job holding your breath and pushing hard, and we're, we're seeing results. So thank you. I have a Mrs. McLaughlin. So one uh, thing as I look at uh, the, d the data that you've provided today, and I will say this is extremely helpful the way this chart was done. Um, really appreciate uh, the brain is able to chunk this so quickly. I mean, I can just look through every one of the nine magisterial districts and look for the numbers to pop out. So this is outstanding. Uh, one drill down question I had was, I can see where some numbers, you just, they leap off the page and you say, how can there be that many trailers? But some may be due to a CIP project, correct? So my request as a next step would be that this document, you kind of revise it a little bit and put an asterisk by every one of the schools that has a CIP project so that that way we can really identify which ones we know are just a temporary impact from the, the renovation, especially the right in the midst of it, whereas other ones, it's it's a problem. By definition, they are all temporary. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, Mr. Moon, that, that would be the case. But when we see that even from the one-page business statement that in the next four years, we hope to reduce it from 768 to 650, that's not temporary. That 
that's definitely not temporary. So um, I, I do want to highlight a couple things. Um, so I, I noticed, for example, in Braddock District, um, Woodson only has two. Lake Braddock, it appears, has none. But Robinson has 17. Um, Frost Middle School, nine. Now, for the big one, the again, thinking from an elementary school, Wakefield Forest Elementary, 11. It's an elementary school, and there's 11 trailers there. So um, uh, going to the next district, Herndon High School, 27. CIP project, is that why? Okay. Yes, they're being renovated. But, but McLean is not, so McLean's got 10. That's a 10. problem. That's a yeah. problem. Yeah. So then another one, McNair, 22, under renovation, right? So new school. Okay. Uh, South Lakes High School, 17. They're not, they're putting on an addition. So the addition is forced the temporary trailers. Well, most of these schools, what you're seeing is those are the actual counts prior to the completion of the project. So that these counts do not include the temporary classrooms associated with the project. They're separate. So if you recall when I said we have 822, and then associated with the capital projects, I have another around 300, a little over 300. Right, that, so the 173 that I said in the, the current projects, those are some of the ones that you're seeing there. Okay, so uh, just to be clear, in case the, you know anyone's watching this and trying to understand it as, as well as I'm trying, so Herndon, when we list 27 temporary classrooms, those aren't expected to be there for very long. That's a, that's a problem that we're gonna be able to correct. That's correct. Okay. But some of them, like let's go with Wakefield Forest Elementary with 11 trailers, there's nothing on the horizon right now to fix that. Well, actually, um, Wakefield Forest is really close in the queue. So I think they're going to show up and we'll be able to okay. handle close that Okay, close in one. the queue for their renovation. Yes, yes, but I to, agree with right, you. Right, but to my point that right now, that's just so... Um, Throughout the whole document, we could kind of put an asterisk on the one the projects we're currently working on and maybe projects that are upcoming yeah i think that something that sort of bit. gives an asterisk that says the number looks yeah. bad but it's be, but it's coming. it is a cip related um a solution is coming up. yeah yeah it, because i think some of these like hybla valley is there a solution coming for hybla valley or is that just overcrowding there uh, there's a, a couple but yes the hybla valley's in this bond okay so, uh, you know, Annandale Terrace. They're in this bond. Okay. For construction. Annandale High School. Uh, 21 I, there. I prefer not to answer that question. Okay. 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 Well, you know, 21 does, you know, and I have a third, uh, 30% of the school. So Sandy and I both have to answer to the community when if they see this number they're going to want to know and i understand we can talk offline and get more clarity but the those are the things that again i think the community tries to understand and um i guess i would you know west potomac why does west potomac have 18 trailers that's why west potomac is listed to have um yeah yeah they're right. they're listed to have a uh, a new addition on the bond Okay. And uh, the so once again, what we're finding is because of our population booms, we're just having to build lots of additions onto our schools. Um, to, okay. So yeah, I think and that will be I very think helpful. The whole point of having additional CIP dollars is if we had additional funding and we could move the renovations along much faster, we can eliminate the temporary trailers a lot faster. Right. So. Not to preempt anything again, but so I would appreciate the, the asterisk that kind of says, here's the ones where we actually have solutions in the pipeline. That's fine. What I would also appreciate, if I missed it somewhere, it's my apologies, but I think it would be really helpful, Dr. Braybrand, since this is coming from you and staff, to say to the board, with something like this, I don't want to preempt where you might have planned to do it elsewhere, but I think we do need to have something that says, from your mind's eye, here are, you know, 10 to you know, 20 schools out of, you know, the top 10% out of the 200 schools where we're saying 
we are going to need some real board work on uh, on addressing some problems here. This isn't no amount of CIP is going to fix this because right now I don't really have a sense collectively as a board. I know that you work with our magisterial districts, but I think in the end we own this as a board. And so it would be helpful to kind of get a sense that we're on the same page with each other collectively as a county. Where, where are our, our biggest problems and how are we working together to get some alleviation there? Right. So fortunately, we have a CIP work session in two months that will give you guys time to look through this. And okay. there's frequently instances where we're looking at a condition out of school and the solution isn't always to build our way out. It isn't just because we have limited funding, but there's other decisions to be made. So uh, we'll have the draft up in a few weeks, and then you guys will have plenty of time to think about it before we come back in January. We are going to be here next month as well to talk about enrollment trends. Right, and I appreciate that. I just I wanted to kind of plant the seed, Dr. Brabrand, because I know that Kevin and Jeff do an incredible job in this arena, and there's only so much staff. But when you have 200 schools, I mean, we we need to kind of have a game plan, and I. I I, I struggle sometimes as a board member that I don't want to go dig into some of these numbers and not find and then find out that no, that's got the solution already to it. But and I think that it's hard for Jeff and Kevin to sit down with nine individual magisterial board members to go through. So maybe if we figure out that the two by twos where like Ms. Schultz and I share so many of our schools because of where our boundaries are with our magisterial districts, it might save you guys time too. I want Ms. Belchick to be followed by Mr. Narkofax and myself. I thank you. Um, appreciate the work and the way it's presented. First of all, I want to commend you. It was just at Luther Jackson and love the new science classrooms. Um, so I think that was a really innovative solution where the principal said, we don't need this locker space, and we turned it into two science labs. So being that I believe that's the school with the most classrooms or one of them uh, near the top, and I know we're looking at a boundary change there. So I guess that kind of thing, I'm wondering, are, a, are we looking at um, innovative solutions like that? Hey, maybe we don't need all of these lockers in this area. Well, the fact of the matter is, besides uh, moving trailers around. So the capacity architects who at one time were under design and construction are now in planning under Jessica. They work with my design staff and we do this every summer. We're creating spaces and we have, but as I said, the budget is very limited. So last summer we built uh, similar spaces in West Potomac the, and in McLean High School. So that's a, another thing. We do this all the time, yes. Okay. I mean, so it just, that seems like a good solution. Um, I guess the, the downside of that um, is that we now have these middle schools that are growing um, and uh, some may be wanting us to relook our formulas for security staffing um, because they're feeling like they're getting to the size of a high school. Um, and are still being staffed like smaller middle schools. So that's kind of a separate conversation, Dr. Braybrand uh, and Jeff, but if we can start to look at as we try to compact more students into some of our growing area middle schools, um, can, we, can we rethink the security formula for their staffing? Um, and then finally, I know I talked to Matt Guilfoyle about this, but I love the way this is set up and I had asked if it, if it would be possible to um, get the information in the CIP, which is just so incredible, um, but to help families have asked for it to be broken down by the pyramid level, you know, not adding additional work right now, but it's such a huge document and people who are not used to looking at it every single day are saying, help me advocate even for the bond. Let me see what it means to my, my pyramid. So I don't know if you could work with Matt Guilfoyle and his staff to help us communicate um, this information and CIP information um, more at a, a pyramid or, you know, a pyramid level. Yeah, but extracting it so people aren't like going through and trying to find every little detail and whether we're connecting it to this uh, or other. So like page 41 of the CIP and then the individual pages, um, if that makes, I don't know if I'm making sense at this point of the day. 
then we could kind of show you where what we have and then maybe what you're looking for. Okay, to kind perfect. Of see. Thank you. Okay, I have a Mr. Narkofax next. Thank you for um, the, the charts in particular um, about the classroom overcrowding by magisterial district. That's excellent. And that's, as many of my colleagues said, very, very helpful for us. So thank you. Um, I think, you know, this is a question that I probably should have asked when the county staff was here. But um, when we talk about, and, and this really doesn't have to do with my district, it's more um, Ms. Strauss and Mr. Wilson's, um, that, you know, they talked about looking at uh, the vacancy rate. You know, we've had high, vac high vacancy rates. And are we looking at that when we're looking at, you know, you talk about the office space, the office buildings and things like that. Are we looking at those, particularly out in the Dulles, McLean areas? Because it's not so much in my area, but that was more of a question I probably should have asked the last part of this. The session. answer is yes, we have in the past where, you know, we, we look at any option right. and any possibility. Kevin and his team does an excellent job. If there's vacant office space, he'll review it. He reviewed a number of different parcels. Well, uh, I, out in that I area. think that's very important because that was the excuse that the Board of Supervisors continues to use. We can't, we can't, you know, we have so much unleased office space, so we can't give you enough money. So, and well, no, that was that has been uh, but, right. I think you actually made a good point because if you paid attention to what uh, they were saying, is that these parcels that are being developed were originally for a commercial use. Okay. So if you're uh, a developer sitting on a piece of land and uh, what do you want to do? Well, if we have a vacant office space, you wouldn't build that, right? Right. You're going to build residential where there's a demand. And they look at these units, especially along the Dulles Corridor, even though if you live out along Route 28 or Herndon, you, we probably know what's coming if they build it from you know, fundamentally the toll road down to Westfield, it's, we're probably, uh, but that's what they're looking at is converting all of those particular parcels from commercial to residential, uh, which is why, uh, you know, Jessica initially when last year, when she started out as a planner, I wouldn't have known this until she told me and I should give her uh, recognition also for putting this chart together. I didn't do it, just your new direct, director of planning did. But uh, so when we finally recognized it, uh, we spent months, Jeff and Janie, uh, Jessica and I, with Supervisor Fowles in an attempt to mitigate this. We need two elementary schools in an area where three elementary schools are within half a mile of each other. So you have Hutchison at 1,000 kids, you have Coates at 835, we have McNair at 1,400, and even by the, small, the smaller formula, which was our yield, right? We were using an overall yield average. We need two elementaries, let alone the impact to a high middle, which we haven't even calculated. And that's within that small of an area. Does that, does that help answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. So I think they're going to go for residential because they're not right now. Commercial is not. It's too much vacant commercial property. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah, that wasn't crystal clear to me during the earlier part, and I just saw that I had left over that question. Um, I, you know, I... I think we all know what's in the future. Um, I think... And I think perhaps... We will need guidance from staff on the best way to pursue this. Um, you know, there's overcrowding in my area. There's a new elementary school bonded. We're kind of waiting for some of the Embark um, properties to see what happens before we do that. There's all of that in McLean. And this is going to require um, at some point, and I think we would need guidance because it is, um, you know, the six years that I've been on this board, I have had many, uh, many issues that have been um, difficult to manage. But um, I understand boundaries is its own brand of happiness. And, um, you know, how we are going to navigate that if we just kind of do it all at once or we do. But, but when you have Tyson's, you have Lincolnia, you have um, Mount Vernon and Lee, there's a lot of things happening. And how to best do that, I think we're going to need a lot of guidance from staff. 
and um, we are going to have to be very prepared um, during that time that um, most other issues are off the radar of this board. It, it's a different way to plan. And if we haven't really, really <laughs> talked about that as we go forward in our strategic plan, and that has to kind of be looked at too, you know, it, because it, it, it will take a lot of board work. And even though the plan will then be kind of out of the board, you know, it, it should be moving forward. But there's always going to be things that the board, but that's going to be a very difficult time whenever that happens for this board and how we best can do it section by section, but it's going to have a domino effect. I know, Dr. Brabham, that you seem to be wanting to speak on this, but I'm going to ask you to hold off until I am done with mine, because I've been oh, wanting I to speak on this for, for, for I don't know how many years. So uh, let me get these out. Uh, in, a, in my colleagues, to my colleagues, I think I have shared this with the staff when we were preparing for this work session. My bottom line is this. My bottom line is this. This needs to be brought up in more open manner to the attention of county board of supervisors and the community at large. They need to see how many students we are educating in very, very subpar condition for how long? I mean, yes, some of the classes may be very, really, really temporary, but most of these class, many of these classrooms, temporary classrooms, are permanent temporary classrooms which is unacceptable. I mean, I find that unacceptable, and that can only be dealt with by the funding authority. The $155 million we, we get, I know, granted that we get another, we receive, we began receiving another $13.4 million, but how long has that amount been fixed? And let's see how that number is being, number is compared to the amount of capital funding county has been using over the same period of time. Whether their capital funding has been, has remained the same all these years, just like ours has, and see how they compare. And also, I want us to do, do some homework, prep work, before we approach the county board of supervisors at a joint meeting. So, Mr. Sneed? I'm gonna ask you a whole bunch of things, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak quickly, more quickly than I have been. I think earlier, I think Mr. Prattenberg, you suggested potential three solutions, way, three ways to deal with this. More capital funding, that I'll be advocating for, and you said program distributions, and also minor boundary changes. I wanna know some in, in very rough estimate, if you did some changes to the uh, program distributions and some minor boundary changes. How many classrooms, temporary classrooms, we can reduce in certain amount of time? Because I think that, that has to be laid out because supervisors can certainly say, you have excess capacity in those areas. Why don't you do boundary changes? Oh, you have all these programs, special, specialized programs. In these are overcrowding those schools. Why can't you shift those programs from other places? We need to be prepared to be able to answer those questions. So in as much as you know, possible, if you could provide us those information, I would appreciate it. Another, another uh, you know, I think Mr. Koufax might have been, or Ms. Evans uh, mentioned a modulars. I know that when we build a brand new building, we do a brick and, brick and mortar, we don't, we don't put whole bunch of modulars to educate on our schools. We don't call it a new building when you put up the whole lot of modulars, which means I have to assume that brick and mortar is supposedly better than modulars. We prefer brick and mortar as opposed to modulars. And we have close to 9,000 students being educated in modulars throughout the county. And we have, as you see up there, 19, over 19,000 you know, students in temporary classrooms, meaning that we have close to 30,000 students being educated in subpar condition. In my mind, again, that's not acceptable. I wanna see, I know that we been able to reduce, and we will continue to reduce some temporary classrooms as we go through CIP, but I wanna see in five years, how many classrooms will, how many temporary classrooms will still be left, and how many modulars, and how many kids will be 
educated in 10 years, how many in 15 years so that I can show to supervisors and community at large, because who's gonna have to support us that at a particular location, we will see at least 5,000 students being educated in the temporary classrooms for the next 15 years, 20 years. Is that acceptable to you? And is that acceptable to Fairfax County? I know, I've said enough. <laughs> Ms. Ms. Church. Oh, Dr. Brabrand, I'm sorry. Let me let you all finish your conversation. I'll, I'll add in if I need to at the end. Okay, um, a, couple, a couple of things. Um, first of all, um, I, I think the other, can we go to the other um, temporary classrooms by school? Um, I'm not exactly sure, and I, this isn't a criticism because this was again a late ad. Mr. Moon and I, these two um, uh, charts did not exist when we had our meeting manager. On we, asked, we asked for these. Th this should be by pyramid. This this one should be sorted by pyramid. I ha I've tried to figure it out. It's not alphabetical. I don't think. Okay, well that doesn't that doesn't help. So. Uh, what what it should be is is be, it, to mirror the CIP. It should be by pyramid that will help. Number two, um, the number of trailers over time. Um, we should have you know basically probably like a ten year running total um, in the CIP. But certainly as a follow up to this, so for a next step, um, number of to uh, n number of classrooms over time. Um, it, you don't need analysis. You just the no, the number the number is fine the raw number is fine we can all look at the number um, I want to address the point that Miss McLaughlin brought up about the the number of trailers by school and the impact because we do need to have an impact sort of an impact statement that if that we have trailers that are there can you go to um, the Springfield district please um, uh, to West Springfield. So at the bottom, you see West Springfield High School. So that's under, everybody knows that's under major renovation, right? Uh, you see there are 12 temporary classrooms there, major renovation. Um, if you could look just above that at Centerville High School, which I keep bringing up, which has a dearth of 555 seats in four years, 14 trailers, no renovation. You, that's the impact. Do you see? This is the exact thing that I'm talking about. Is you have 12 trailers at West Springfield because you have a renovation. You have 14 at Centerville with no renovation going on. In addition, if you could go to um, Sully Westfields, so down 13, no no um, uh, renovation. If you go to Braddock, please, Robinson. Well, you already said it, Ms. McLaughlin, 17. So that so even where you have a renovation going on, you have fewer trailers in some places that are as a result of and about to be relieved of the need to have them. And you have other places where there's no end in sight um, and there's a long-term impact. You know, And when you're talking about a secondary school, that means from middle school all the way through high school, those kids are subjected to um, trailers. And that's, that's the equity piece. Um, I do want to say that um, we are um, reviving CPDC. Um, it has on, been on life support, but uh, we have our first meeting, I think, next week. Oh, jeez, for the love of Pete. <laughs> it is still on life support. Um, apparently, it's on oxygen as well. Um, but I do want to ask, you said there were 13,567 students added since 2010. Mr. Plattenberg, Mr. Sneed, how many new schools have we built in that amount of time? No. How many new schools? 13,567. I think. One, right? Mason Crest. Um, okay, well, all right, so one and a half, so Fort Belvoir. And Fort, Fort Belvoir. Okay, so two and a half schools, because we split one school. So two and a half, you can generously say three schools. Um, 13,567 students and three schools. That's the conversation we need to have with the supervisors. Now, granted, we've added classrooms with renovations, but the trailers over time, 
the SAC classroom brick mortar instead of the kids being educated in a trailer instead, don't, don't, don't grimace at me. This is where we have the uh, ability. So um, I did have the next step of the uh, number of students per magisterial district, so we understand the distribution. So I think we're ready for next steps. Okay, next steps. Oh, Dr. Brebrand. <laughs> Well, I think uh, it's, what, our fourth or fifth month together? Um, listen, even today, I'm bringing you topics of things with a solution or a menu of solutions. You may not like all of it, but I think you're going to find in this superintendent and this leadership team, we're going to bring you the material necessary for you to make decisions. They're hard decisions. The truth of the matter is, in my belief, over the years and years in Fairfax, we've gotten to this point because this has been the path of least political resistance. That's the truth for the school board and for the board of supervisors. To solve the problems that are being presented today are going to require a far greater level of collaboration between the board, school board, and the board of supervisors than has ever existed before. I think staff is beginning to develop those deeper relationships. And I think the menu that Mr. Moon outlined, um, and it's going to be somewhere on that menu when we have to develop the menu for, for you, and we will, between additional funds, between looking at program changes and realignment, because we have a lot of programs and we move a lot of kids to a lot of different schools that are not their natural boundary, and looking at boundary adjustments themselves, which we have been loath to touch. It's been considered the third rail it's come up in region meetings already, and we're going to have to figure out and embrace that we need to have the promise of excellence, the promise of equity in every school, so that when we go to these adjustments, it doesn't, for the community, appear to be a win-lose. That someplace I go, I'm going to be a winner, and someplace I'm not. Every school in Fairfax County is a place for every kid to be a winner, for every kid to have their full potential. It, they're hard conversations. The good news is I think we're beginning to prepare our community for the tough decisions we have. Um, but I want you to know um, I'll bring you the decisions. I'm not afraid to make a decision. I love this place. It's not going to be easy. The intentions are good. We're just going to have to work harder than before, um, collaborate more with the Board of Supervisors, and be willing to make some tough calls. Um, but this board has already shown in my time here, you've tackled some very tough issues. You all don't necessarily agree completely on all of them, but you find a way to come to consensus and make a decision, and that's what we're going to have to do. Um, I really do want to appreciate the staff. They've been, you know, they've been busting uh, their tails, working a lot of hours to get it done the way this board wants to see it done, and we're going to continue to do that. Thank you. Appreciate it, Dr. Brabrand. How would that? Next steps up. Oh. Okay, uh, board members, I want you to all take a look at what you got up there. Uh, wherever you have your name next to it, make sure that the wordings are correctly put up. On the fourth bullet, just make it, we need to make that clear. We're talking about county, county bonds. Thank you. How, I'm sorry, that's not how many have been issued, it's how much, how much, right. how much of the yes, bonds, good, good, how of much the, of the bonds approved, of, yes, the bond referendum, have been sold and issued. Appro yeah, approved in to, uh, 2012, 14, and 16 referendum, referenda. Okay, uh, bottom, that's, it's not just the boundary adjustments, but also program redistributions and additional capital funding, right? Because those are three suggested solutions to deal with. And boundary adjustments, comma, oh. and then deal it with. I, I don't know if there are any more, but do you have the number of trailers over time, like a 10-year history of trailers? Okay. 
Sure you will. Okay. Sure you will. I'll give it to you if you need it. Okay, Mrs. Mrs. Okay, Mrs. McLachlan. Uh, for, for my bullet on the CIP projects pending, um, Kevin and Jeff, I mean, I'm trying to figure out, I would, first I would just say which schools have current or pending projects, but the question would be, how pending are we talking about? I mean, right. obviously our CIP can go out 10 years. I don't think that's really helpful, but. We talked about providing a key to okay. get more inform you was the intent. Okay. So, good point. Yeah, th thank you. And did you have um, the uh, um, uh, trailers by school in pyramid order? I didn't see those. It, it's just the same document, just we, you know, added in, in pyramid order. Okay. Yep, yep. Okay, you had Ms. Corpus It goes back to the question of um, where there's capacity in the building, uh, where there's excess capacity in the building, but we're still using trailers. That's the. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, to save some time, if board members could all take a look at what's up there. And if you have any reservation or questions or ob objection to any one of those, please speak up. Could you move up the screen so that ones at the bottom could be seen? Any, anyone? Oh, uh, if you yes. go up a bit, um, I, if, if board members are all right with this, under the bullet about how many trailers are over 20 years old, could we also see how many modulars are over 20 years old? Okay. Anybody else? If not, thank you very much. We'll, there, we'll take a two-minute break. And we are going to do FCPS on next. No, because we have teachers here. So FCPS on will be next. Uh, by the way, I